We've never done it that way before. Those are words you don't have to hang around the church a very long time to hear thrown around. In fact, those are words that are often the last words, the dying words of many churches. Perhaps they'll be the last words of our great bride, the United Methodist Church. We've never done it that way before. Change is uncomfortable. We get uh, comfortable with the people, places, and things in our life. We get comfortable with the routines and the way that we do things. Uh, we get comfortable in certain protocol, even if it's wrong, even if it's killing us. Uh, change is like this big curtain of, of fear, of terror. And we don't know what's on the other side. So we'd rather stay on this side of change. And the devil that you know is better than, than the one you don't know, people say. And so we get stuck in a way of doing things, even if that way can be toxic. Even if that way can be sick. Even if that way can lead to death. But we serve a God who's a God of change. Can I get an amen? Y'all going to have to wake up this morning. We serve a God of transformation. We serve a God who's always recreating, always creating, always transforming, always changing. And He's always transforming us. In fact, that's what it means to be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to be caught up in that dynamic cycle of change, that transformation, being more and more conformed into the very image of Christ. And that's what we should be doing individually. That's what we should be doing personally. And that's what we should be doing as a church. Growing into the very image, the likeness of Christ. But we get stuck in these ruts and we say, well, this is the way we've always done things. So let's just keep things that way. But God is not just the God of yesterday. He's not just the God of tomorrow. He's not just the God of back then in the golden age, those days when things were so sweet. And He's not just the God of tomorrow, by and by, pie in the sky, one day I'll fly away, God. But He's the God of then, He's the God of tomorrow, and He's the God of today. He's the God of now. I came to tell you this morning about resurrection then. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your word. A word that uh, is not just something that we read, but something that transforms us, that we consume, that shapes who we are as people and as a community. A word that sometimes challenges. A word that sometimes inspires. But we pray, oh Lord, that we could leave away the concerns of our life this morning. That we could experience you in a new way. That your word would come to live and dwell in us. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We live in a dark time in our world and in our nation. Uh, you don't have to watch the news long to see that. Every day there's natural disasters, there's murders, there's assaults, there's uh, hurricanes and tornadoes in Oklahoma, there's earthquakes in Japan, there's tsunamis, there's earthquakes in diverse places, there's wars and rumors of wars, there's nations that are setting themselves up for nuclear capabilities, and our country, our nation, is in a time of drought. Uh, as a nation, we've strayed away from God. We've strayed away from the Christian principles that our country was founded upon, that our spiritual forefathers built this nation upon, our new Jerusalem. Uh, we've strayed away from those things and we've replaced in God we trust with in money we trust or with in science we trust. Uh, we've given over our own children. We've taken away uh, Bibles and prayer from school. And we're experiencing right now a drought, an economic drought, a psychological, emotional drought. And the truth that the gospel tells us is that we'll never deal with the drought in our finances. We'll never deal with the drought in our political systems until we deal with the drought in our souls. We'll never deal with the psychological, emotional uh, chaos in our lives until we deal with the drought in the relationship that we have with God. And part of the problem is, to be frank, is the church in the United States of America. We've watered down the gospel. Uh, we've made church user-friendly. 
Uh, we just want to make it convenient and comfortable for you. We want you to, to believe that if you just come and sit in the pew on Sunday mornings and give God a nice tip, well, that's all there is to being a Christian. But that's very far from the truth. We've forgotten that call to the cross, that call of a transformed life, that call of discipleship, of living a cruciform life in a subversive way to the ways of this world and the patterns of this life. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. The call to Christianity is one of transformation. It's one of discipleship. And it's a call that we've, to a large degree, left out of the church of Jesus Christ today. And our nation is suffering the consequences of that. Uh, this is something that happened in the history of Israel over and over again. The nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, found themselves in this dark place. They strayed away from God. They set up false idols to God. Uh, they started to worship foreign gods and accept anything as acceptable and behaviors that are acceptable. And this downward spiral kind of started uh, at the reign of King Solomon, whose wisdom really drove him mad, as we can see in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he, he, he goes after false gods and marries uh, people from other uh, nations and religions. Then we see a kind of downward spiral uh, in the kingdom from that point on. We see one wicked king after another succession of those kings, until we get to this guy, Ahab, in the time of Elijah. Uh, Ahab is the most wicked king that, that has taken the throne yet in Israel, and Ahab marries this priestess of Baal, uh, whose name is Jezebel, and he sets up these false uh, temples to false gods, these idols, and the, the whole nation is, is, is reprobate, they, they won't repent, they turn away from God. And so there's this drought that settles over the land. Now, a drought in the ancient world is a serious thing. Uh, in an agrarian society in the ancient world, everything was fueled. Uh, rain and water was the source of life. If you didn't have water, then you didn't have the crops. And if you didn't have the crops, then you didn't have livestock. And if you didn't have crops, you didn't have livestock. You had starvation. You had destitution. You had people sick and dying of starvation. And that was the case. Uh, in the ministry of Elijah. Elijah is one of the greatest, uh, most powerful servants of God in the Old Testament. He's a forerunner of Jesus Christ. He's a prototype of Jesus. And we see some very similar uh, things in the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Elijah. He's one of the only people in the Bible that gets taken up. Uh, and, and the Bible seems to indicate that he doesn't die, uh, but he goes to be with God. And Elijah uh, has a tough word and a tough time in a drought situation to go to King Ahab and say there's not going to be a drop of rain on this place. This drought is not going to be uh, uh, taken away until you turn your hearts back to God, until you repent, until you get your lives right. And so Elijah, because of this tough word that he has to proclaim, is sent out into the wilderness uh, where he's fed by ravens. And in the ministry of Elijah, we see God to start to do a new thing. We see God to work in a way that's not necessarily the way we've always done that before. We see Elijah fed by ravens, unclean birds, which no uh, respectable Jew would allow to happen. And he's drinking from this brook uh, until that brook dries up. And then Elijah gets sent to this widow, this Sidonian Gentile widow, to uh, be with her. God sends her to this woman. And it's interesting that of all the widows in Jerusalem of that time, as Jesus picks up later in the New Testament, that, that God could have sent Elijah to, he sends Elijah really essentially to the enemy, uh, to, to a religious and racial enemy, and to be in relationship with this woman. And he sends him to a woman that has nothing. In fact, when Elijah arrives on the scene, this woman's gathering some sticks with her orphan son, and they're getting prepared to, to use the last little oil and meal that they have to take that last meal and then die. But Elijah is sent to be with her, and he makes some requests of her, and she honors those requests. And through that relationship of just being with her, God begins to supernaturally sustain and feed uh, Elijah, the woman, and her son. And then, uh, after this relationship has happened for a while, uh, we get to our text this morning, in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, starting in the 17th verse. And we get the first resurrection miracle in the history of the Bible. There are nine different occasions in the scriptures when somebody is resurrected from the dead. And this is the first one. 
we got to kind of unpackage a little bit. Uh, I believe it's going to be real important for us to move forward as a church uh, in, into our future that God has for us, for us to understand the resurrection. Uh, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the resurrection. I think it's something we really need to dig into and understand. And I think through kind of seeking to understand the resurrection, we might experience one. Amen? So the first uh, thing I want to talk about is, is the understanding of the resurrection that the Hebrews had. Uh, it's very different than what we have today. We see this kind of evolution of the concept of resurrection through the Old Testament. Uh, in the beginning, really, uh, the Hebrews didn't even have an understanding of a resurrection or an afterlife. They believed from the dust you came, from the dust you returned. And their, their, their focus of their theology, or the way that they think about God, was more about our relationship here in this life with God. And you receive your reward for, for just actions and wicked actions here now in this earth, for your righteousness or your wickedness. And that was really the understanding that they had. I think it's, it's something that we should probably put some more emphasis on today. That it's not just we're waiting to go to heaven one day uh, in the sky, but we have a relationship with God right now. And there are implications of that relationship with God that we enjoy right now, here and here and now. But that resurrection understanding kind of evolves throughout the Old Testament. Um, and they begin to think about this place called Sheol, the place of the dead, where when you die, you go into Sheol and you exist there kind of in a, a state of sleep uh, for the rest of your life, kind of as a shade, uh, uh, as a spirit in Sheol. And then when we get to the later prophets like Daniel and Isaiah and the book of Job, we start to understand this concept of a bodily resurrection. But really, their initial understanding of resurrection was one of a, a corporate resurrection. Of the nation as a kingdom would be resurrected with God in the center of that kingdom here and now on this earth. And then in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament, we see a, a real evolution take place. And then when Jesus comes... We get the full revelation of what the resurrection is, and, and it's all kind of brought together in the ministry of Jesus Christ. So this passage that we're looking at this morning is the first uh, uh, occasion of resurrection throughout the Bible. In the 17th chapter of the first book of Kings, in the 17th verse, uh, Elijah and this widow have had this relationship going on where this uh, jar of oil has been given and this, this, this meal that is supernaturally replenished. So they're eating uh, from, from God's own hand. And in the 17th verse, it says, After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So this boy, the widow's son, gets this sickness, this disease. And it leads to death. There are horrible consequences of sin in this world. Uh, sickness and disease and illness. But it's interesting that sometimes in those situations when things get sick, that sometimes when things get sick, they need to die. Because in that death comes the resurrection. So this little boy uh, has this sickness, this disease. Uh, in a time of famine, there's no access to any kind of medical care. And, and, and he just uh, dies. There's no breath left in him. And so she comes to Elijah and says, What are you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Uh, here you come into my life and we have this kind of relationship and my son dies. Uh, but he said to her, Give me your son. Now I want you to notice right away the resurrection faith that Elijah has. Uh, this, this miracle is very similar to an exact same miracle that Jesus does. But there's some distinction that we'll look at that next week. But Jesus encounters a Gentile woman whose son dies. Jesus resurrects that son from death. Very similar uh, uh, things uh, between the ministry of Jesus. He says, give me your son. He takes the son from her bosom, carries him up to the upper, upper chamber where he's lodging, and lays him on his own bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon this widow with whom I'm staying by killing her son? And not only have you sent me to do this tough ministry, a tough word, in a, in a drought season in our nation, but now I, I come into this woman's life and her son dies. So then he stretched himself out over the child three times. 
That number three is important, and, and we'll unpackage that next week. And he cries out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. Elijah has a resurrection faith uh, that, that believes that this child can be resurrected from the dead. Now there's some big differences in the way Jesus does things and the way Elijah does things because Elijah is praying for God to do this work. Jesus himself does the work uh, in, in his resurrections. So then uh, the, 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 the Lord listens. That's the good news about this. The Lord listens to Elijah's prayer. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. That's a good word, because we can confuse uh, resurrection with resuscitation. When somebody is resurrected from the dead uh, bodily, as we believe in Christ, they <laughs> raise imperishable, uh, and they have eternal life. But, but that's not the case. With the nine resurrections that we have in the Bible, those people are resurrected from the dead. But then what happens? They eventually die again, right? They live out the natural course of their life, and they die. So, so this boy is literally raised up, resurrected, revived. His life, the life of God, goes back into him. And Elijah takes the child, brings him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. And then Elijah says, See, your son is alive. And so the woman says to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. Now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in you. It's interesting in this relationship that when Elijah gets there, he doesn't slap the woman over the head with a scroll or a Bible or try to push his views or even try to tell her about his God. But there's just this relationship of being together. And through that relationship of being together, this miraculous power is unlocked and it ultimately leads to a resurrection. So this passage really asks us to, to ask some kind of tough questions. Does God control nature? Uh, does God cause these storms and these tornadoes, like the one that struck in Oklahoma, uh, that, that killed some people, that leveled whole neighborhoods, and uh, took one house and then left the house of a neighbor? Does God control nature? Well, uh, this situation with Elijah uh, answers that question that, yes, he does. God is God. If He wants to withhold rain, He can withhold rain. If God wants to send rain, He can send rain. If God wants to work through the processes and the nature that He created, He can do that. But the Bible has several answers to this question. Uh, you see, sin entered the equation. We willfully chose to disobey God. And when we disobey God, that did not have just personal consequences. But that had cosmic consequences. Uh, in Genesis, we see a relationship of God and anim uh, human beings and animals are being brought to name. You could wrestle a lion and not be hurt. You, you could dance with a cobra and, and, and there was no death. There was no uh, destruction. There was no uh, chaos in that state before sin entered the equation. But when sin enters the equation, then there's animosity. Uh, there's murder, human between human. There's uh, animals, there's storms, there's death. There's all these processes that are unlocked. So do we believe that God is sitting up on a cloud saying, I'm going to send a tornado today that's going to kill so-and-so and so-and-so? And so? No, we don't. Because there's one other uh, uh, factor that we're leaving out. There's this, this enemy that's in the Bible from cover to cover. From the beginning, he's a serpent. Uh, to We see him in the, the, the last book as a dragon that's cast out of heaven. And this devil goes before God uh, for Job and says, I'm going to strike his life. And, this devil's a, a tremendously powerful being that we don't really understand. He can go into the presence of God. He can rebel against God and still live. And he's got power. He's called the prince of power, the earth of this air. And he has this ability to influence nature and storms. And so this, this question really has several different answers biblically, which is, uh, as human beings, we want a black or white answer, but then we really don't get one in, in this regard. Um, there, there, there's storms, there's, there's nature, there's sin. What the Bible does tell us, what we can bet our bottom dollar on, is that God is with us in the midst of those storms. Amen. That God is with us in those tornadoes of life. That God is with us in our sickness and our disease. And from our finite mortal minds, we can't conceive how God is working to bring about the greatest good in this creation. 
His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so from our perspective, we have to ask why a lot of times. But from God's perspective, He's moving and transforming to recreate everything and bring it all into consummation. There's something I think we need to learn from this, this story uh, in our ministry here while we United Methodist Church. I like how Elijah just went to be with the widow. And I think it's going to be important for us to unlock the resurrection power in this church. It's going to be important for us to learn to be with people. Maybe even with the people that make us uncomfortable. Maybe even with the people that we might consider to be enemies. We're going to have to find ways to be with those people so that the resurrection power of God can be unlocked. Do we realize at all that our church has been sick for a while? Do we realize at all that we've been in decline for 10 years? Amen. Do we realize at all that, that the way we've always done it before is not working? Can I get an amen? amen. Are you all late this morning? Do we realize that we serve a God of transformation and change? That, that once He's with us and He wants to unlock this resurrection power. But we're going to have to be willing to change. We're going to have to be willing to walk through that veil, that curtain of fear. And to be transformed and allow Him to do what He wants to do in this congregation. I'm always upset on Wednesday nights that more people don't show up to that Wednesday night fellowship dinner because it's a way to be with the people of our community. We brought in different uh, uh, folks from the Lazarus Clinic and the Domestic Violence Shelter and the REC Residence Encounter Christ and the Free Ministry so they can come and they can tell us about their ministries in the community here, how we can be involved with that, how we can be with them, they share with us, how we can be in relationship with them. And through those relationships, through being with them, that resurrection power of God is unlocked. We're going to have to find out what God's will is and how He's transforming us. We're going to have to realize that there's some things in our ministry that are sick. There's some things that need to die. And there's some things that need to be resurrected, need to be recreated. In order to grow and to thrive and to become the church God's called us to be, that's what we're going to have to do. Every year in this district, Numerous churches are closed down. Every year in the United Methodist Church in America, hundreds of churches close their doors. And I think it's largely because we're stuck in our own ways. We've not held fast to the doctrine, discipline, spirit with which we first set out. And we're not giving that opportunity to be with people so the resurrection and power of God can be unlocked. This last weekend, I had the opportunity to go into the uh, Sumter County Jail uh, in a Residence Encounter Christ ministry experience. And uh, I always try to be the undercover pastor in those situations because when you come in and tell somebody you're a pastor, the dynamic changes the way that they relate to you. So I just try to sit there with the inmates and just talk to them at their tables, hear their stories and what brought them there. And the first day, uh, the first day of the weekend, this guy came to me and he says, Man, there's this glow on you. There, there, I want to I hear your story. I want to know about you. There's something about you that I, I want to get to know you. And, and so that, just by being with that man, just being in relationship with him, that opened the door to a conversation to tell him, hey, what's different about me is not me, but it's Christ living in me. And what you see is the Holy Spirit. And this Christ, he wants that same relationship with you. He wants to put that glow in you. And that weekend, last weekend, we had about 40 or 50 guys just on the men's side. And every one of those men, every single one of them, came to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Or recommitted themselves to Christ. Every single one of them. Right there in that jail, just by finding a way to be with the people, uh, the resurrection power of Christ is unlocked. And if that resurrection power could be unlocked in a jailhouse, just think what it can do in a church with a bunch of willing servants who are willing to be caught up in that transformative process of becoming new in Him. So we're going to have to get out of that mentality, folks, that we've always done it that way before. We're going to have to get into the prayerful attitude about with God, of God, what are you doing? How do I be a part of it? And how do I be with the people so that your resurrection power can be unlocked? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful opportunity to gather in your word and to worship you. And each Sunday we have a 
amazing opportunity to gather and to hear from you and to study your scripture, to worship, and to come to your table. Lord, each week, uh, nobody here this morning is perfect. Each week, we accumulate uh, mistakes and sin. As we try to be sanctified and be transformed into your image, we often fall short. We know that your word tells us all have fallen short of the glory and sin. So we thank you that you provided this holy Eucharistic meal. That we can gather at your table and we can have our sins forgiven. And that we can take afresh of your grace and your broken body and your blood which was poured out, broken, and shed for us. So as we come to this table, let us not do it lightly, but let us search our own hearts and realize that we have things that need to be left in this at your altar this morning as we partake of this holy Eucharistic meal. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.